Hello everyone. I at least wanted to start out politically correct in this environment with all the viruses running around. So you can see that I was actually following our good governor's dictates to be wearing these masks. But so I can talk a little bit better and since everybody is more than six feet away, I'm going to dispense it if everybody's okay with that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I want to wish everybody a good afternoon. I want to welcome you all to a seminar on Montana government. Just to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me, I'm Ed Butcher. I spent 10 years in the Montana Senate and House where I served in legislative leadership, being selected as a committee chairman every term I served in the, representing central Montana, which is rather unusual. It was quite a load, but the important thing is I was able to observe the bureaucracy and the political maneuvering from the inside. And that's really the perspective that I'm going to be talking about today. Before I was a rancher and businessman, I also spent 10 years as a college history and political science professor. That's important because that's where I learned history and the true mechanics of our constitutional government, the American government as it was intended. Today, I want to introduce you to the real world of how Montana state government has grown from a $6 billion budget to a $13 billion spending of Montana tax dollars in 16 years. And I think that's important for people to understand. Now, here's your state capital. This is where the bureaucracy resides and the deals are cut. That building is a heartbeat of the Montana swamp. Now, Donald Trump meets the real people as he battles to drain the big swamp in Washington, D.C. And of course, that big swamp in D.C. is where, as we're all generally aware, an awful lot of politicians fill their personal bank accounts. Now, how does the Montana swamp actually work? And I think this probably illustrates it as well as anything else. You can see the swamp creatures Oh, what do we have here? This is the leader of the Republican, Democrat wing of the Republican Party. His name is Lou Jones. I'll refer to him periodically. He's the millionaire representative out of Conrad, and he loves control and power. This is one of his right-hand men. This is Eric Moore. He's out of Miles City, representing a very conservative district. And he's Lou Jones's right-hand man. Then we have this little guy over here. This guy comes out of Sydney. His name is Crowder. And we'll talk a little bit more about him as time goes on. But he came, he's one of the main ringleaders, along with Jones, as his henchman. And then, of course, the real turncoat is Nancy Balance. She's a representative now running for the Senate in the Bitterroot Valley. She started out as a Tea Party person. She is now one of the ringleaders of pushing Jones's deals. He's cut with Governor Bullock. Governor Schweitzer began with and then Governor Bullock. So these are the characters that make up the swamp. Now I can't really fill the shoes of the guy that I'm replacing, Donald Trump, because he's the master of cleaning the swamp. But I'm make, do, making a little effort here. We'll see what we can do with it. Now, how does this swamp really work? First, how can government grow when voters elect Republicans? Because Republicans, especially in these rural areas where most of those ringleaders come from, those are conservative areas. They vote 60, 70, 80 percent Republican. They vote for Trump. They're promising fiscal, fiscal responsibility. But in reality, they're quietly voting with Democrats to spend money and grow government. 
And that's where the problem comes. Now, how do they do this? I think the, the big thing that we see is as they move into this picture is the epitome of what the old system was like before term limits. Term limits has pretty much killed this whole backroom deals and power brokers and all that because they don't stay in office long enough. No one stays in the same office more than eight years. Well, they don't quite have time to dig the trenches deep enough to become corrupt. But this still goes on. And the new version started out, and of course, Lou Jones is the leader of this, and we'll continue to talk about Representative Jones. It started out as the log cabin bunch under Schweitzer. They broke the Republican efforts to try and rein Schweitzer in on his budget. We were ready, I was in that, serving in that session. We were trying, going to go to the mat, and we'd go clear to the special session, because Schweitzer was demanding a 40% increase in spending, which was ridiculous. And to put this in perspective, before Schweitzer, you never, you, it was all, government always grew. It just historically grows. But it was only growing one and a half to two percent. Schweitzer got in, and during his term, he averaged right around 40% growth every session. And this was where this log cabin bunch led by Jones finally broke with the Republican majority. We only had about a two-vote majority at the time, so it didn't take very many of them crossing over to help the Democrats, and they, of course, voted in a block. That was the beginning. And then, as... as Time has gone on. They evolved into calling themselves the Responsibles, the Responsible Republicans. Now they call themselves the Solution Caucus. But they're all these kind of folks that we see there cutting these backroom deals. Now, the real question is, you've got a problem. We're trying to, hopefully today, we'll help you kind of identify that problem and then what can be done to fix that problem. Because that's what we really need to do. If you understand the problem, then you have to look and see how can we fix it. Well, is the problem Democrats being Democrats? No, it's not. When you elect a Democrat, you expect someone on the perspective between a socialist and a communist that want government spending, government control, concentration of authority in the central government. Is the problem Republicans being Republicans? No. Now I speak of this from a personal perspective. My family were always Democrats. I was raised a Democrat. And it was about the time Jimmy Carter came in I realized the socialists were taking over the Democratic Party. And that's when I abandoned them. And I'm sure a lot of the folks out here can identify with that. Because I know in the audience there are going to be people that at one time were Democrats. In my precinct in Winifred, they used to vote 200 and some Democrats to about 75 Republicans. Now, interestingly enough, it has changed to 200 and some Republicans to about 70 Democrats. It wasn't a big influx of people. The locals are still there. They just began to realize that the, de the old party of Roosevelt, that it, they gave credit for bailing them out of the Depression, which that's another issue as a political scientist I could dispute. But anyway, that if people are changing. And so it, now the problem is not within the Republican Party itself. The problem is you have Republicans trying to be, as we said, Republican light. I like to say Democrats running as Republicans. In other words, basically Democrats. Now, this would be the splinter group of Republicans that call themselves the Solution Caucus. So let's turn, how do we identify these folks? How do we identify them? Well, it's fairly simple. 
if you study what's going on in Helena, here's the makeup of the House of Representatives of the 2019 session. There were 42 Democrats. We had 58 Republicans. We had a majority of Republicans that were the conservatives, since there were 38 of them, they were called the 38 special. But then in that Republican Party, we had 20 in the splinter group, which called themselves the Solution Caucus. They were cutting deals with the Democrat governor, constantly cutting deals. Jones is the ideal deal cutter. And these other folks in here, they just kind of go along with the flow. They like to have people pat them on the back and tell them what nice guys they are. I won't say that they're accepting bribes or anything. I don't think very many of them are. They're just weak people that ran as they have basic Democrat tendencies. And now the Democratic Party has gotten smart. The last few elections, they've actually been running Democrats in conservative Republican districts claiming they're conservative Republicans. Since most voters don't really know the people that well, they just accept that. Now the problem is, is when this 20, 20 member splitter group joins over with the Democrats, all of a sudden they control the legislature. This is how Schweitzer and then Bullock were able to pass all their legislation. Bullock brags about the fact he got along with both sides of the house. When Schweitzer originally thought he was going to run for president back in the 50, 10 years ago, he was also bragging the same thing. And it wasn't because they were such good guys. It was they cut deals with Lou Jones and Splinter Group. Now, we're talking about the Montana swamp. And of course, that's something that Trump has uh, coined. I think it's, it, Trump is very good at naming things. He names people, you know, Sleepy Joe, you know, whatever the case may be. And they fit and they stick. And the, the swamp is a very good description of what goes on in Washington, D.C. Now, what do we need, mean when we talk about the swamp? Now, we know the Democrats are the basis of this swamp because they're the ones that are wanting more government control. They're the ones that are wanting to rake in as much tax dollars as they can. But we also have two distinct groups within the Republican Party, and that's where the problem comes. That's why I'm talking to primary voters. You have to know who you're voting for if you're a Republican. I'm not talking to the Democrats. They're sitting there smiling. They know they got the dog by the tail on this one. I'm talking to Republicans. You need to know what's going on. Now you have the main body of Republican Party, the majority, and they are the majority in the legislature. But then you have this Solutions Caucus, this splinter group of Republicans who broke it, broke it off. Now these people hold their own meetings, they do their own planning, their own strategy. Uh, they work completely outside of the Republican Party. They're the ones that cut the deals with the Democrats and a Democrat governor. Now, some of them benefit financially, but most of them, they just like the kudos with the media telling, putting their name in the paper how great they are. Some of us don't get near as good a media press as this group does. Now, some of us, I always took the, the old saying to Huey Long that, of course he was a socialist, but the Huey Long down in Louisiana back in the 30s, we don't have very many people in the crowd that remember that, but Huey Long used to say, I don't care what they say about me as long as they spell my name right. That was his favorite deal. But you takes a thick-skinned person like Donald Trump to take the kind of abuse that the media heaps upon him. And so most people, they want to go to the hell. They think it's great to be a representative or a senator. They can come around and give some talks to the local school kids. And everybody kind of admires your legislators. And you should. But not all of them. You need to know what they're doing, what's going on behind the scenes. Now, one way to identify this separate group, this solutions faction, is by looking at scorecards during the legislative session. And there are a lot of scorecards. There are all kinds of scorecards. And this is one of the things I want to help you understand today 
to be able to sort between what's the legitimate scorecards and what aren't. Now these are all very prominent scorecards and it's important for you to understand their foundation and how they operate. Most of them have a very narrow focus. The Family Foundation, which is of course the very conservative right to life group, uh, uh, it's based off of uh, uh, family, values. family values. It's 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 the real foundation for a lot of conservative Christians, voters, and such. They give people A's, they give people F's, but they only scored ten bills. And this is important for you to understand. Montana's for limited government. A very, very solid conservative group that's upset with the growth of government and increase in taxes. But again, they only had 10 bills that they scored to people on. The Montana Farm Bureau, these rural areas, everybody looks at the Farm Bureau. Oh, this guy got an A from the Farm Bureau. He's one of their top people. What did they base that on? They based it on 18 bills. The Montana Chamber of Commerce. Now they had 25 bills. They had a lot more special interest groups within it that are concerned about. So they scored on 25 bills. The Montana Contractors Association, this is probably very outside of the educational lobby, the Montana Contractors Association is probably the strongest lobby in Helena. You know, the oil companies and the rest of them, they don't have any, they don't even hold a candle to the teachers union and the educational bureaucracy and lobby and the contract association. You've got to remember, the contractor association are getting millions and millions of tax dollars for their road projects, for their building projects. There's a lot of money going through that, that people in hell in the handle. That people who are, and there's nothing, I mean somebody has to build the roads. If they're done fair, I don't, I don't fault them. But they're obviously going to have a good lobbying group over there. And they're going to be really leaning on legislators. Now this, the fact of these few bills and what is going on, this is why a, little, uh, uh, a website called Legistats was developed to try and cut through the BS and actually identify where these legislators are voting. Now I give credit to my son who's passed on now. He was the one that was very frustrated. Those of you who knew Travis know that he was very much of a political activist. Sharp guy. He sat down with some computer people and they developed legistats because he was fed up with these people who were claiming they were conservatives and yet they go and spend all this money. They grow government, etc. And so anyway, uh, the one thing we want to point out, he wanted to be fair. He did not want this to be a partisan thing. He said, we've got to sort through the BS and figure out what is fair. And so the numbers for legislats are generated by con computer algorithm. algorithms, there we go, straight from the Montana State website. And it comes off of www.legislature.montana.gov. And you can go to it. This is a wide open website. Every voter can go and check their legislator out, and I think you'll find it very informative. And you go to www.legislatorloyalty.com, boom, you got access to exactly how your representative is voting. Now, the reason I'm talking about these bills and these numbers and everything is that in the 2019 session, Legistats scored 610 partisan votes in the House and 465 partisan votes in the Senate. Now, out of all this, a total of 375 bills were eventually passed to the governor to sign or veto. Now, the reason this is important, there's 3,000 bills introduced in the average session of the legislature. Most of them are not ready for prime time. They're special interest bills. They're stupid bills. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. Most of them are killed in committee. That's why you have the committee process. Because then if you want a bill passed, you get your legislator to introduce it. He has the draft, it's introduced, it goes before the committee. You get up there and you testify before the committee of why this, bill, this law it needs to be put in the law. This idea needs to be put in the law. 
And out of that, the committee looks at it, they rule one way or the other, they table it, most of them are tabled. Some of them have to be introduced four or five times before the problems in them are sorted out. It's not that they're bad bills. Some of them may just not be mature enough to go into our Montana state laws. We don't want every good idea going in there if it's a half-baked approach. And so, a lot, most bills don't get passed, for, most new ideas don't get passed the first time through the legislature. Usually, they're, they're in, they go in two or three different sessions before they finally get sorted out that the legislators are comfortable that they're actually needed. Now, the one thing I want to emphasize, because of course, as you can imagine, when I start going around the state giving this presentation, and I want to give credit for this presentation to my sidekick here, Lonnie Bergstrom. Uh, Lonnie's done the research. He's the guy that built this web, uh, this uh, website, I guess you'd call it. So uh, it did a tremendous job digging material, digging information out. Now, the thing with this, what Legistats does is it identifies legislator loyalty to the Republican platform, to the Republican leadership, the Republican majority. It does not cherry pick bills. Those other groups, they have 10 bills, they have 18 bills, they're cherry pick bills. They don't reflect the overall voting patterns of legislators. The other thing I want to emphasize, because we're, you know, we're getting quite a little criticism from obviously the swamp is not real happy with what I'm doing. And the, uh, all the legislators are scored on the exact same votes. And the way these, we'll mention it several times, the way these votes are selected, to whether they're partisan or not, if 50% or more of the Republicans vote one way and 50% or more of the Democrats vote the other way, that's considered a partisan bill. It could be a partisan Democrat bill, it could be a partisan Republican bill. Well, what Legistas does is it through the computer going into the website, it pulls all these votes out and it identifies the Republicans who cross over, well, it identifies all the voters, we're talking about Republicans, that cross over and support the Democrats voting against the Republican majority. Because the majority of the Republicans vote one way, these guys vote the other way with the Democrats. There's no special interest group influence. They claim that all oh, it's all been, you know, uh, jimmied around and worked on. It's not true. There's no special interest. There's no lobbying influence. And what's important to understand on this, it scores all second and third reading votes on the House and Senate floors that fall under this 50% uh, that are partisan. Now, the reason this is important, any of you who follow politics probably, you'll run into a legislator and you point out and say, you know, I supported that bill. Oh yeah, I voted for it. And then he'll go to you and you say, you know, I was opposed to it. Oh, I opposed it. Well, now how could a guy oppose and support, claim he's opposed and support the same bill? He's not lying. He's truthful. Surprisingly, for a politician, some people would say. But what he's doing is on the second reading, now, a bill is introduced into a floor that it comes out of committee and the first reading it's read across the podium, as they say. In other words, it's introduced to the House. We'll just talk about the House. <clears throat> it's introduced to the House and then it's the leadership appoints it to come up on the calendar for debate, usually a day or two later. Second reading is where the bill is debated on the floor. And how this works is a person in favor of the bill out of committee and a person that was on the committee that heard that bill and heard all the testimony of all you folks that went to Helena to testify for or against it. So you've got one guy testifying in favor of the bill, the other one giving the reasons why he's opposed the bill, but it's still passed by a majority vote in the committee. And then it's debated. And in the House, the legis each legislator is restricted to three minutes of debate, so you don't get drug out long wind because they got a lot of bills to go through in a given day. And you're only supposed to speak on it once. 
Matter of fact, if you speak out more than once, you basically have to get a, the rest of the members to vote to allow you to speak again. They have to suspend the rules. So anyway, that's where all of the action goes. <clears throat> well, somebody who's opposing this bill, he does his damnedest to get it defeated in that second reading. But if he doesn't care, prevail and the bill is passed out of second reading, then it go, is chalked up or marked up for third reading, which is usually the next day at the beginning of the session, tw at 1 o'clock when, the, when the, uh, the floor is convened. They have, there's no debate, there's no discussion. They're, all the bills are listed and every legislator is, votes yes or no for that bill that comes through. And if it passes, then it goes to, to the next house and then on to the governor. That's how the process works. So when you're looking at these votes, the guy can say, I voted for it, or I voted against it when it came up. Well, he did when he fought it in the second reading. But then third reading comes up, he votes for it because it's going to pass anyway. He couldn't stop it. So this way, he can take credit on either side of the bill. So just so you understand why we call, we call both of them, that's why you get more, sometimes more votes than are actually our bills because you're voting, you've got two votes on each bill basically as it comes up in the House or the Senate. Now, it's kind of interesting and Lonnie is going to give a little demonstration here of how we compare a couple of legislators' votes and the visual I think is very important. In this particular demonstration, we are using the vote of House Majority Leader Brad Cheetah and Speaker of the House Greg Hertz. These are the two leaders. They were elected by the Republican majority to be the Speaker and the Majority Leader in the House. So these are the uh, these are what we call crossover votes uh, by uh, Speaker of the House Greg Hertz. He had uh, 36 crossover votes uh, for a crossover rate of 5.9 percent, but that still kept him in a, as a uh, A category a rated legislator. What this tells you is that even being in majority in the in the House, not not every Republican bill is a good bill, and not every Democrat bill is a bad bill. Uh, there is always room for some crossover on from anybody. So this was a. Uh, Represent our speaker hurts, and here is Majority Leader Brad Cheetah. Brad, uh, Majority Leader Cheetah, House District 97, had 27 crossover votes for a rate of only 4.4 percent, also A rated. And just in comparison, we'll do a comparison to them to uh, Lou Jones, the head of the uh, Solutions Caucus. So this is, I have an assistant here for Lou Jones. Representative Jones, House District 18, he had 203 crossover votes out of the 610. So that was a total of 33.6%, which put him into the F category. And we'll see if we can... Now think about this, folks. A third of the Democrat votes he supported, and he's running as a Republican from a conservative district. These are uh, Representative Jones' crossover votes. I, I almost ran out of ink here in paper, Ed. Yeah. Well, and he isn't the worst, but he's, down, he's in the F group, and he is the leader of the bunch. Interestingly enough, Jones actually supports Democrat bills. It doesn't support him as much as some of his fellow caucus members that are true Democrats. So, you kind of get an idea. Now, what's interesting here, you saw the visual comparison of what we're talking about. House leadership average across or among all the leadership of 5.2 percent. And again, there are, I voted for Democrat bills because they were bills that were important to my district and some of them I thought were probably pretty good bills. People have differences of opinion. We don't expect people to lock and vote 100 percent. Now, the Democrats come real close to that because they don't tolerate much crossover. Uh, they, get, they, get, they get hammered on real heavy. Okay, 610 votes were partisan votes. And here's how the three groups voted. You had the Democrats 
crossing over to vote at a rate of 5.5% of the time. So the Democrats do cross over and vote for some Republican bills. You'll have guys like Jimmy Keene, a strong Democrat out of Butte, for infrastructure and energy development, because he wants jobs, he will cross over and support a Republican bill supporting energy development and such, opposing his Democrat majority, which are comprised of radical environmentalists and socialists and the rest of them. So there are people on the Democrat side that do cross over in certain instances and support it. Now, the 38 specials are called the conservatives, which are the majority of the Republicans so far. And that's why we're out on this tour, because Jones' screw is trying to defeat a bunch of our strong conservatives to bring in his Democrat Republican people in, in some Republican districts. But the 38 special, the conservatives, this is the most conservative of the Republicans, they still crossed over an average of 8.7% of the time. In other words, when they talk about reaching across the aisle, you listen to Bullock and the rest of these morons talking about, oh, why don't we reach across the aisle? And you get a guy in the car and how come you guys can't get along? Well, <laughs> it looks like the Republicans are doing their share. They, they cross over almost twice as much as the Democrats do. That tells you why we've got problems in growth of government. Now let's go to the splinter group, the splinter faction that Jones leads. They average 36.1% of the time, and several of their members cross over more than 50% of the time supporting Democrat bills. Now do you know why we've got a problem in government in Montana? Now do you understand, starting to get a picture of how this swamp actually works? Now the members of this splinter group, the Sushin's Caucus, were four times more likely to vote with the Democrats than were the majority of the Republicans. Now you think about this, four times they stabbed their fellow Republicans in the back. They voted 6.5 times more with the Democrats than the Democrats voted with the Republicans. So much for reaching across the aisle, right? Now, we want to throw a little example, because uh, the, there's, the Jones's faction has been beating us up on the face, on the, on the, uh, some of these media platforms, pretty heavy, claiming that we're being unfair and whatever. So this is an example of a bill that wouldn't be scored. See, they say, claim we should be scoring every bill, which of course waters this whole thing down, so you lose the fact that the big spending bills are partisan bills. Now this is an example of a bill that the computer would not pick up because it passed 100 to 0 in the House and 50 to 0 in the Senate. In other words, every legislator passed it. Well, what kind of bills make this up? Well, here's a classic example. They changed the effective date of a law. Nobody's in disagreement with that. And an awful lot of bills that do go through the legislature are bills, maybe not quite that simple, but very similar to that. There are bills that nobody opposes. They're cleaning up language. They're cleaning up bad bills that are improperly written. There have got to be a lot of problems, so they came back in and they reworked an existing bill in the book. Those, the, the laws in Montana are constantly being reviewed and reworked because sometimes what they thought was a good intention had unforeseen consequences. And so consequently, they're constantly working on that. Well, most of those go through without any problem. Now, here is an example of a bill that was scored by legislators. Only three Republicans vote against this. This was a Second Amendment concealed weapons bill. Now, it takes a pretty gutsy Republican coming from a conservative area to vote against your Second Amendment rights. But here's our favorite one, Representative Geraldine Custer out of Forsyth. She's a great Democrat. She votes for the Democrats virtually all the time. Representative Grubbs out of Bozeman and Representative Durham, where was he from? Uh, Libby. Loud Libby. Representative Durham out of Libby. Now, Libby should be a conservative area. But here again, the folks up there, are, it, it, I'm sure he goes back and glad hands and buys him coffee and beer and whatever, and they vote for him. He's a nice guy, right? But anyway, that bill. Now, because we now have three caucus groups in Helena, two in the Republican Party, I think it's important for those of you out here that are getting ready to vote in this primary, when you have a legislator who has an opponent, 
It's a fair question to answer. All those candidates are Ryan's Republican. Which group are you going to join? Are you going to join Jones's Democrat wing of the Republican Party? Or are you going to stay with the Republican majority that are trying to follow the Republican platform? Those are the, that, that's really the important question that any of you who have contested races need to answer. I don't care if the guy has a beard and you don't like it. I don't care if the guy, you know, looks, doesn't, doesn't dress right. You know, whatever the issue may be that people pick on, say, oh, I don't got to support that person. Or you have a really good looking candidate. And so you're going to go ahead and now yeah, it's very personal, you support them. No, no, you want to ask them this fundamental question. Who are they going to support? Now, here's where we're getting down the nitty gritty for those of you who are looking at different legislators. Many of these will be in your districts. And we're identifying. These are the D's and F's. In other words, these are the people that were crossing over at least 25%, 20 to 25% of the time. And we're talking about a quarter of the Democrat bills they're supporting. Now, Democrats may have some really sharp people, but I can't quite believe they have that many good bills that we need to be pushing through. Now, as you go through this, uh, of course, these are Julie Dooley. Her husband's running for uh, Congress. Eh, interesting. See where his wife votes. Uh, of course, Eric Moore is uh, out of Mile City. Uh, you kind of come through all of these people as you see the different ones that are in here. The, the red, Ed, I'd like to point out, the red ones are all the ones that have primaries. Yeah, okay, the red ones are all being primary. Now, we, they're, they're, some of these people are waking up and they're going to try to take these out. So if you're in the area that these people represent, here you see the people who are in this group. You better take a really good look at the opponent because the opponent is running against them because he or she is more conservative or they consider themselves more conservative. Now these guys, McCamey and Anderson, they don't have an opponent. Of course, we put highlighted Lou Jones since he doesn't have an opponent either. Uh, he owns Conrad, so nobody dares run against him. Uh, then you get over to Sydney, Crowder. Interesting character. This guy went to Liberty University, and those of you who are familiar with the private Christian schools know that that is one of the most conservative of the, of the college universities, this big university back in Virginia. What's interesting is the, Jerry Falwell, the founder of that group, was the, one of the first of the evangelicals to come out and support Trump. Everybody thought he was crazy. How can you support a guy like Trump? Well, he had an insight into Trump. Well, this, Jerry, this Crowder went to school there. He should be okay, right? He comes to Sydney as an attorney. He's telling everybody, he becomes chairman of the Central Committee, gets very involved in politics, convinces everybody he's a good, solid Republican. The problem was, when he was at Liberty University, he organized the Young Democrats. He was the head of the Obama re-election group at Liberty University. Now, at Liberty University, they probably met in a closet. I can't imagine there being that many left-wingers going to Liberty University. But it tells you about the character of this guy. And he's representing Sydney, Montana, that votes 80% Republican. Okay, Nancy Balance, Beirut. First couple sessions, she was okay. She vote, was voting with the Republicans. Then she ran for Speaker of the House. The Republican majority didn't elect her to that leadership. She gets mad, and all of a sudden she joins Jones's faction. And so she has been one of the top crossover people, and she's actually on the Appropriation Committee as one of Jones's main leaders. Now, she's important because, as you see, she's in red. She has a primary. She's running against one of the very, very strong conservative, Menzella. Menzella has, been, has a great record in the legislature, and they're, they're both in the House. Now they're running for that Senate seat. So those of you who are in the bitter route need to set and really analyze this vote and be careful you don't get sucked in by Nancy's fancy talk. Ed Buttrey, of course, is a trust baby out of Great Falls. He's one of Jones's key people. He's Bullock's big boy because he carried, he actually sponsored the Medicaid expansion bill, which was defeated in a general election vote. 
I mean, the voters of Montana turned it down by what, 50 some percent overall? 53%. Yeah, they turned it down. And yet, he's, here's a Republican carrying, that's where they're what, reaching across the outcomes. And Bullock was running for president, telling, bragging about how he could work with Republicans. Well, he was working with Democrats who were happen to be running in Republican precincts. Uh, you get down to, now Walt Sales is no relation to Scott Sales, who has a very strong conservative record, but he's running, he's a rancher, farmer down there in that, in the uh, uh, Bozeman area, Yellen County, that's running for, actually I think it's Scott Sales' is old seat he's running, because of the name like, name like Sales, the guy keeps getting elected. His voting record's horrible. Uh, here you get into, uh, down in that Dillon area, Ray Shaw. That's a Republican area. We've had some fantastic conservative legislators representing the area. Frank Gardner is one of the only ones over in the Bitterroot, or I mean, excuse me, the Flathead. Uh, he, has a, he has a terrible record over there. He again has an opponent. Jerry O'Neill. Uh, Jerry O'Neill has served off and on in a very conservative guy who's a, 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 out of that uh, Flathead area. And then, of course, you get down to Bruce Grubbs. And Geraldine Cush, these are the two down at the top. This, well, uh, Tom Welch is out of yeah. Dillon. I mean, 80% Republican. And people down there even know his family's all Democrats. He's Democrat all his life. But he gets elected. He and his buddy Wellborn, who's uh, the senator out of that area now. Anyway, this gives you an idea. As you look at Legistat, you go on to legislatorloyalty.com, you'll see the first column that you see when you pull, up, pull them up are the, the Republican votes that they, the or partisan bills that they supported. The second count are the times, number of bills that are votes that they crossed over and voted. So just to give you a little bit of a feeling, and then of course they have the D through the F down below here, so the, uh, the rating. So anyway, now, obviously this is the Legistats program. It's based on Legistats. We're pushing this thing for people to educate them. But we want to do a comparison. There's a group called Montana's for Limited Government. And it's interesting because they also rated the, uh, uh, the legislators as to how much big government spending they were doing. And here's the Montana's for Limited Government, 2019. Now all the 70s and under are in red. These are their DNFs. They're also the same as Legistats. It's very interesting because whatever, and I don't know how they're doing their rating system. They, everybody has their own rating system. But in their rating system, they still came up with the same, identifying the same bunch of Jones and Splinter Group. So we're not alone. We're not alone. And we won't take time to go through all this, but you can get a feeling here if you happen to shut, to stop this, uh, this video down, you can stop it down and actually study the the, uh, the votes, and you'll see they're kind of in groups. It's very interesting. Gardner's out of uh, again out of Kalispell. Here's the Great Falls bunch. Uh, here's uh, Sydney, the only Eastern Montana one is uh, Crowder over there. And then you get well, I shouldn't say only. Then there's a Mile City. Mile City has three people in it. Well, two there, and then Geraldine Custer's a Forsyth. And then you got this bunch down at. Uh, uh, Helena, uh, uh, Julie Dooling's from Helena, uh, but the uh, Grubbs and Sales, Shaw and Welch all in the eastern Montana. And then you go to Bitterroot. It's amazing to see what's going on in western Montana. Most of the good solid Republicans are good solid Republicans, but you got this little bunch starting with Beattie, Balance, Grief, Hopkins, and then of course Joe Reed comes out of a reservation district, which you kind of give him a little bit of a slack when you're in a reservation district because obviously he's got to have to vote for a lot of the Democrat welfare bills if he's going to get reelected on a reservation. But a lot of the other bills he's been, he, he, he works at it. He's, he's, a, he's a good representative. He's, he works at it. Now, here again, we, we referred to, we've identified Solution Caucus. Just to show that this isn't something off the wall, here is Montana Free Press. Now, this is the Democrat online left wing, I shouldn't even say Democrat, it's a left wing online, uh, what do you call it, magazine? Online? Internet news. Internet news. It's internet news. Montana Free Press. Uh, it's very interesting. They identify them all, and here they are, the whole list of them. 
We identify them by their vote, they identify them by individual names. So we're not the only ones that are notify they're identifying this Democrat wing of the Republican Party. Now here's an interesting, this is how Governor Bullock and the Bozeman Chronicle describes the Solution Caucus. This is a quote from Bullock. The Solution Caucus, a group of Democrats and modern Republicans, headed by Representative Lou Jones from Conrad. The governor identifying by name. Now it's interesting, in this particular article, he's complaining because they didn't stay with him on his climate change nonsense. Now when Bullock's running for the U.S. Senate, you folks better keep in mind how far left this guy actually is. Just a side issue. But the, even, even some of these Repu liberal, liberal Republican representatives that would go along with 30 and 40 percent of the votes, they couldn't quite even go as far as the climate change nonsense. And, the, and the, uh, now they did follow, uh, uh, renewal of Medicaid expansion, and of course they financed some, some of these big government infrastructure. But you got to remember, folks, Montana has to have a balanced budget. But that is somewhat misleading. Because when you bond businesses, you're going outside the budget. They didn't come under the budget. Because that's a debt that's been taken. And so when you set up these big bonding projects, it's future taxes being generated outside of the normal tax structure. Now how did these backroom deals, what did they get us? I was just going to take a couple of examples for time. The Medicaid expansion, that was House Bill 658. Sponsored by Republican Buttry, as I pointed out before, passed by 100% of the Democrats and 29% of the Republicans. Now, we have to give credit, 71% of the Republicans did vote no. They had to run it through, I don't know, what was it, 16, 17 times. They finally got it passed by one vote. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on down the road. Then, of course, you go back to 17, another favorite one. This was a gas tax, and those of you who are, are driving a lot of vehicles, trucking or whatever. This was carried by Representative Garner out of Kalispell. Again, a Republican. The Democrats always have Republicans front for them. It was passed by the Solution Caucus. 21% of the Republicans with 90%, 6% of the Republicans. Actually, 4% of the Republicans, our yeah. Democrats actually vote against it. I mean, that's, that's kind of, here's where you see a crossover on the Democrats occasionally. It was opposed by 79% of the Republicans. But in that 17 session, it was a close to the, the Democrats, or the Republicans didn't have that big a majority, so it didn't take as many to cross over to get it passed. And then, of course, this CSKT water compact. And I won't take the time to go into that, but this is probably the most criminal thing that ever came through. And this was pushed through by the Republicans. They're the ones that Democrats, of course, supported 100%. As you'll see up there, 100% of Democrats, 26% of the Republicans support it. It was signed by Bullock. It was pushed by uh, Tim Fox, who's Attorney General. They voted on 17 times to finally get the thing passed. And this was largely could be credited to Representative Congressman Reber. Because after he got defeated for election to the Senate, he became a Washington, D.C. lobbyist. And the word is that money filtered through the tribes, probably a lot of international money from environmentalists and such, filtered through somewhere in the neighborhood of $3 million. Now we also have to give credit to where credit is due. This is the problem of the Farm Bureau and the stock growers. They follow the advice of their left-wing lawyer who claims to be a property rights, a lawyer out of Bozeman named Hertha Lund. She was the one that they, they worship her. They think she's a great genius. And she, her law firm, as reported, got $90,000. I don't know that for a fact, but that was what the rumor was for getting that through. So this is a swamp we're talking about, folks. When we're talking about draining the swamp and addressing the swamp in Helena, you're starting to see where this swampy stuff starts coming down. And most of it in our state is because of the Republicans. New York, it's because of the Democrats. California, it's because of the Democrats. But in Montana, it's because of this Wheeler Dealer splinter group of Republicans that are following the ace Wheeler Dealer, who is Lou Jones. Now, I'm just going to take for a minute 
to get this explanation so you can kind of follow through where we're talking. Montana had a Medicaid expansion on the ballot. So the voters all got to vote for it. The Montana voters voted down Medicaid expansion. And of course, there's a lot of stuff in this Medicaid expansion, including taxpayer-funded sex changes and abortions can fall under this, just for those of you conservative folks that have some issue with that. Now, you want to keep in mind, there were only five counties that voted for Medicaid expansion, Missoula, Silver Bowl, Glacier, Gallatin, and Lewis and Clark. All Democrat counties, right? They're the only counties in Montana, countywide, that, that actually passed it. 71% of the Republicans, the majority, voted against Medicaid expansion. So we have again the Splinter Group, the Solutions Caucus, that voted against their Republican majority, their Republican leadership. You can understand why a lot of the Republican leaders are frustrated in Montana legislature, because they keep getting stabbed in the back by Jones's bunch. And yet they go back and tell everybody how conservative they are. They've actually, under Solutions Caucus, the last month or two, they've actually added now Conservative Solutions Caucus to their titles. So I guess there may be some people out there dumb enough to fall for it, but there we are. Now with the last comment on this Medicaid expansion, Senator Daines criticized the state of Montana during a Senate subcommittee hearing, saying his policies of Medicaid has made it more at risk to abuse and fraud compared to a lot of other states. Well, the state administration is run by Bullock. So what can we say? Now, he made his comments after noting the U.S. government improperly spent $36 billion in fiscal year 2011 on Medicaid expansion. And the audit has shown errors in income reporting for people eligible. You've got to remember, Medicaid expansion only took in single, young, able-bodied able folks. Nobody, nobody's worried about Medicaid not there. We're fine. Medicaid's going to take care of somebody's disabled, older folks. There's a lot of people that there's a reason for Medicaid to help maintain their lifestyle or their uh, some quality of life at least. Well, we're concerned about it, what the opposition to Medicaid expansion was. Why should 20-year-old, 25, 30-year-old, able-bodied people that refuse to get a job be getting covered with Medicaid? Is that logical? Just a thought I'd ask you. Now, since I'm speaking basically to a Republican group out there, if some of you Republicans get concerned, how, what can you do about it? Now, the following candidates need your help in defeating Jones's solution faction. We need people to get elected that will bring conservative principles back to Helena politics. And you have to keep in mind, it costs money to campaign, especially now, it looks like Soros is going to be dumping millions into Montana because it's U.S. Now that they've got Bullock jumped in against Danes, they hope they can, it's a one shot at trying to take out, take that Senate seat. And of course, unfortunately, a bunch of the Ocheski people are beating up on Danes because of the water compact. And a lot of people in western Montana, based on that single vote, are going to refuse to support Danes. Now, Danes has an incredibly conservative voting record in D.C., well over 80 uh, percent. Clubs for Growth support, have only supported that I've seen since they came into being. And they're a pact that supports conservative candidates. They've only supported two Montana congressional candidates in their history. Reberg couldn't meet the qualifications. None of the others could meet the qualifications. Of course, most of them were Democrats. That's understandable. But Rosendale was one of the first ones they endorsed because of his conservative principles and his, good, his fiscal responsibility shown during the times he served in various state offices and Danes. So you can send any of these legislative candidates up to $180 per person. So if you get your 10 kids, they can each send $180 if you got the money to do it. It's useful. But even 25 or 50 bucks sent to these candidates help if enough people give. And what we've done <clears throat> is in this primary, we want to show who 
the important candidates. We're not listing everybody. These are ones who have primary opponents. So the, there's a lot of good conservatives that aren't listed here because they just don't have, they're running unopposed, they don't have primary components. Uh, here you, you start down the, the list of them. Uh, House, uh, House District 6, House District 7, House District 9. Now that one uh, is an incumbent that's being challenged, right? Yeah, yeah. These, are, these, these, are, these are open seats here. But these are ones that Jones has filed people against. Against the red, the red ones are uh, where are incumbents that have a challenger. The ones in black are just uh, actually conservatives challenging, probably incumbents on the Solutions Caucus. Yeah, some of them are challenging incumbent Solutions Caucus people. The ones in black, but anyway, um, you go down. Of course, Skies is a, one of their time prime targets. They really got to get him out of there because Skies is probably one of the most vocal of the conservatives on the, in the legislature. Um, you come down through this group, Casey Knudsen, he's up in Malta. Very, very solid, uh, good solid conservative Republican, representing a rural area. Uh, they Jones has recruited a woman out of Glasgow to run against him. Uh, then you've got Rhonda Knudsen, and now this is... Um, Austin, Austin, there I got it. Right. Austin Knudsen is running for Attorney General, and he's been in the legislature. He was Speaker of the House, one of our really strong Republicans in the legislature. His mother, this is his mother, who's uh, filed for that seat there. She's an incumbent, and they've got somebody filed against her. Uh, Brandon Lear is very important because he's the one that's going against uh, uh, Crowder. Crowder and Sydney. That's, that's an important seat to win. Uh, Phelan. That's Alan Dome's uh, termed out seat. Yeah, this is a termed out seat. There's four running that in there. Yeah. Yeah, four different ones. This is apparently the more conservative of the bunch. Jerry Schellinger is a very critical election. If you know people in that circle, from Circle, Jordan, all the way over to Broadus, if you know people in that area, get on the phone and talk to them. Because Jerry Schellinger is a CPA and his background for quite a while. He's a big farmer up in. Uh, in circle, uh, he'd been farming for years, but he was in his first life. He was actually a, a certified public accountant for a number of years before he took over the farm. He understands numbers. We need him in the appropriations committee in the house. Uh, you can go on down. You can see uh, uh, the Bo these are the Bozeman folks here. Uh, here you got down this this uh, Randall Ra Ravendall, excuse me. Ravendall is running against. Joe Dooling's wife, and she has a horrible record over it out of out of Helena. Uh, so you know you need to look at, and then of course Devoy uh, De Beers has got somebody filed against him too. Go ahead and move the next one. Then we have these are the other house seats. Uh, that's, uh, 85, uh, 86. That's Manzella's old seat, 85. Yeah, uh, replacement for Manzella, who is running for the Senate. Uh, you got uh, 86, he's running against Beattie. Beattie. He's running against Beattie. Beattie's one of the Jones's uh, strongest supporters. Uh, you got, 88 is uh, Balance's old seat. She's got somebody in there that right. she's trying to get around. Yeah. This is an important one to knock out. One. It'll, be, it'll be a Jones supporter that she's running against. And then uh, Jim Cruz and Stevens. Running against Grief. Yeah, Grief is another one that has a very poor voting record. Now you look at the Senate, Carl Glim is of course running in Columbia Falls, and of course we've been talking about Teresa Manzella that's running against Nancy Balance over there in, the, in the bitter, very important, these are very important seats to win. Uh, Gary Perry has come back, he served in the Senate when I was in the Senate, way back in 2000, he was in the early 2000s, uh, he's now uh, filed to run, uh, who's he is that he's filing? Uh, it's Scott Sales' old seat. Okay. If he's running against Walt Sales. I mean, yeah, Walt Sales. Yeah, he's running against Walt Sales, who's he's, uh, came Senate from District that. 35. What's that? Senate District yeah, 35. Senate District 35. Okay, these are the conservatives in these races. Do we have any? Uh, go ahead. That's, that's what is the Solutions Caucus? Elect market servants of legislature, real Republicans of follow the party platform, elect a Republican governor who will put a stop to this. 
And we want to point out gubernatorial candidate Tim Fox is endorsed by the Solutions Caucus. Uh, if we have a Republican governor, then the Solution Caucus loses a lot of their power for cutting deals. If that governor will stand with a Republican majority. Uh, the Solution Caucus actually would prefer to see a Democrat elected. Uh, I, would, be, I would, would not be all surprised to see him if uh, Fox loses in the primary for them to, to vote or support uh, the Democrat in general election. So that's where they have the most power when they can cut deals. Thank you all for joining us in this little seminar. Uh, I would entertain questions anyone has, and I would ask you that are picking this up on the internet or Facebook to pass this around to help educate people as to what's going on in the hell in the swamp. Thank you very much.